first and foremost, I want to welcome you and I want to thank you for joining us for a, what amounts to a really important discussion about algae blooms and Florida's water issues. This is such an important topic. And uh, I want to tell you right off the bat that there's no way we can possibly do this topic justice in one hour. It's a topic that I could talk about for hours on end. You know, there, there are multi hundred page books written on this topic. It's an endless topic. So what I'm going to try to do is give you a, a kind of a quick fly through of these issues so you have a better understanding of what's happening to our state's waters and hopefully generate some additional conversation or additional discussion. If I touch on something that you have more questions about, you can certainly email me those questions after the presentation is, is over with. So understand that I may not touch on every point that you're interested in hearing about, but I will do my best to give you a tip of the iceberg overview of what's happening in our state with a real focus on, on algae blooms and water quality issues. So hopefully, even if you know a little bit about this topic, you'll learn a little bit as we go through our program today. Now, just some quick uh, housekeeping notes. If you don't mind, I'd like you all to keep your microphones muted throughout the program today. We have you set up to be muted when you enter the room. This will just ensure that everybody can hear me okay. Uh, you should be seeing my PowerPoint on the left side of your screen and my picture up in the upper right hand corner. If for some reason you can't see my picture, you can click on view options and then select side by side. That'll give you the split screen view. And then there's also a divider between the PowerPoint and my picture. You could slide that back and forth to control the size of the two images. So you can make the PowerPoint nice and big and make my face nice and small. Uh, there's two different ways that you can interact with me today. I'm going to have questions for you throughout the presentation. If you would like to answer a question, use the chat box. So you could type your answer right into the chat box and I will see your answer pop up on my screen in real time. If you have a question for me, go ahead and use the Q&A box. And then at the end of the program, I'll go through all of the questions that are in the Q&A box. And if time allows, I'll do my best to answer everything that comes up as, uh, as we go through the presentation. All right, so I don't think I have to convince any of you that we live in a really special place, especially if you love the water. If you're a boater, an angler, a paddleboarder, a scuba diver, or if you just like spending time around water, Florida is the place to be. Water really defines our state. We have over 8,000 miles of tidal shoreline. We have 11,000 miles of rivers and streams in our state. In fact, we have more coastline than any other state in the United States, except for one. Does anybody know what state has more coastline than the state of Florida? Very good, yeah, Alaska. I wouldn't wanna go swimming in Alaska, so I would say that we have the most swimmable miles of coastline of anywhere in the US. So we've got this, this wonderful state, but our wonderful state is dealing with some pretty big environmental issues. And many of those issues revolve around algae, and algae blooms. So that's a major focus of our presentation today. Many of those algae issues are impacting our coastal estuaries. So what is an estuary? Does anybody know the definition of an estuary? We've got a lot of them in our part of Florida. I'm, I'm coming to you today from my home in Fort Pierce and Florida Oceanographic Society located in Stewart. Both of those towns are built right on an estuary. So yeah, an estuary is a coastal body of water, very good. And particularly, it's a place where fresh water and salt water mix together. So the water in an estuary is generally brackish, not as fresh as the rivers and not as salty as the ocean. It's somewhere in between. In our area, we have two different important estuaries. First, we have the St. Lucie Estuary. If you could see my mouse pointer, this is the St. Lucie Estuary. The St. Lucie Estuary is what's called a flooded river mouth estuary. Essentially, it's a place where a river flows into the sea. And this is the most common type of estuary. Think about Chesapeake Bay, just on a much smaller scale. But arguably, we have a more important estuary in our part of Florida, the Indian River Lagoon Estuary. The Indian River Lagoon starts all the way up in New Smyrna Beach at Ponce Inlet, and it runs down to Jupiter, 156 miles long. The Indian River Lagoon is what's called a bar-built estuary. It is separated from the Atlantic Ocean by a string of barrier islands. And those barrier islands are basically prehistoric sandbars that were formed when sea levels were a little bit higher. Sea levels fluctuated a lot over geological history, and we can see signs of that pretty clearly here in Florida. 
if any of you are boaters or scuba divers and you do some offshore fishing or offshore diving, you know that we have a series of reefs offshore here. Each of those reefs corresponds to a shoreline when sea level was a little bit lower. If you drive across the state of Florida, you notice that you go over some sandy hills or ridges. Each of those sandy ridges is a shoreline from when sea levels were a little bit higher. Our closest sand ridge runs right along the western shoreline of the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, in our area, there used to be a, a commercial pineapple industry. They grew pineapples on that sandy ridge in towns like Stewart and Jensen Beach in the, in the previous century. So we've got this estuary, the Indian River Lagoon, that's nestled between barrier islands and the mainland. And it's a really important place. It is considered one of the most biodiverse estuaries in all of North America. Over 4,300 and counting different species have been identified living in the Indian River Lagoon. So it's an incredibly important place, but it's also a place that's under attack right now. We're talking about algae today, and I wanna start by telling you that not all algae are bad. There's a, a misconception that algae are always harmful. And I think the news media has, has maybe painted that picture for us. In fact, there are thousands of different species of algae on Earth. Many of them are actually beneficial. So in this image, we have a beneficial type of algae. This is sargasm. These are, these are species that live out in the open ocean. They float in, in big mats, and they provide really important habitat for lots of other animals. As you can see in this picture, fish take shelter under floating mats of sargasm, and baby sea turtles use this as their first habitat when they're little tiny juveniles. Now sargasm, I said, is beneficial, but in recent years, we've seen unusual patterns of sargasm growth. It's blooming in parts of the ocean where historically it wasn't found. And there is some evidence suggesting that those blooms are being triggered by pollution running into our oceans. So sargasm is an example of a beneficial species that might become not so beneficial in the future if we keep putting things in our waters that don't belong there. Kelp is another fantastic example of a beneficial type of algae. Kelp provides uh, food and shelter for lots of different animals. Think about our cute sea otters. They rely on healthy kelp forests. So what are algae? Well, they are kind of like plants, but not exactly. Plants are pretty sophisticated. Plants have roots. They have stems that carry water and nutrients. They have leaves. They have flowers. Algae they don't have any of those things. They're sort of like a less sophisticated version of a plant. They have some structures at the bottom of, of their stems that anchor them to the, to the seafloor, but they're not really roots. Their stem-like structures aren't vascular, so they're not actually stems. Instead of leaves, they have very simple blades, and they don't have flowers. But they are a lot like plants in that they get their energy from the sun. They conduct photosynthesis. They use the energy of the sun plus carbon dioxide to create sugar, which is the fuel for plant growth, and they also give off oxygen. In fact, most of the oxygen in our atmosphere was created by algae growing billions of years ago. So some of you may have been kind of questioning me calling sargasm and kelp algae. You're probably thinking, well, those are seaweed, right? Seaweed is just a word that we give to algae that you can see with your naked eye. In today's talk, we're going to be really focusing on microscopic types of algae. But these bigger forms of algae, like kelp and like sargasm, fall into the category of seaweed. And I mentioned that algae are beneficial sometimes. Well, they're actually eaten by human beings. If you like to eat ice cream or yogurt, you're probably eating algae without realizing it. There are thickeners that go into a lot of dairy products that come from extracts from certain types of algae. If you eat sushi, you probably already know that you're eating algae. The nori wrapper on the outside of a sushi roll is a type of seaweed. So we really want to think of algae as unique organisms that provide benefits, but they aren't always positive. And our Florida story really focuses on some of these negative types of algae blooms. These have been in the news a lot over the last couple of years. We've learned about red tides and brown tides and super blooms and blue-green algae. And this is the story that I want to focus on today. I'm gonna start with some of our less harmful, harmful algae blooms and work my way up to the ones that are really and truly dangerous, the toxic types of algae. So our first story is really built around the Northern Indian River Lagoon estuary. And there's three branches of the Northern Indian River Lagoon. 
This area to the left side of our, of our map is the Indian River Lagoon proper. This part here is the Banana River. And then the northern prong from here north is Mosquito Lagoon. But all three of those are technically part of the Indian River Lagoon. As you can see in the satellite image, they're looking pretty green. That's not natural. This is a sign of a massive algae bloom occurring in the Indian River Lagoon. And we've experienced a number of these blooms in recent years. Some of them are more of a pea soup green color. Some of them are more of a chocolatey brown color. And these are not toxic, but they're still really harmful. And I'll show you a good example. This is a bloom of brown algae occurring in the Northern Indian River Lagoon system. Uh, for reference, this is Hallover Canal, if any of you are familiar with that area. And all of this yoo brown water is a result of a bloom of a microscopic type of algae. What do you think this dark brown area is? This is something else growing on the bottom. It's something that's actually really important. Anybody have any guesses? It is a key ecosystem in our estuary. If you like fishing, if you like diving, this is an important, important organism. And yes, very good, it is seagrass. So this is a seagrass bed growing in an area that is experiencing a severe bloom of brown algae. The type of brown algae that we're dealing with in the Indian River Lagoon is called Ario umbra. Here's a microscopic view of it. These are tiny, single-celled, non-toxic organisms. And they're not necessarily native to Florida. We didn't experience these blooms until about 2012, 2013, but they were really a, a huge issue in certain coastal estuaries in Texas. So there is some speculation that they may have gotten to Florida inadvertently. It's also possible that they've been here all along, but they just weren't being uh, triggered to bloom in, in high concentrations. Even though the blooms themselves are made up of microscopic organisms, when those organisms grow sufficiently dense, they make the water opaque and cloudy. And as a result, sunlight is no longer able to reach the bottom of the estuary. And that's having some pretty big impacts on seagrass. Seagrass needs a ton of sunlight to grow. And if it doesn't get light, it starts to die. Think about leaving a tent set up in your backyard for too long, or maybe a sheet of ply plywood laying in the grass. The grass dies, it turns yellow, it withers. Well, we're seeing the same thing happening in the Indian River Lagoon on a much larger scale. In the last decade or so, we have lost at least 50,000 acres of seagrass in our estuary. And I would actually argue the numbers are, are much higher than that. It's pretty hard to measure seagrass accurately. If we, if we were to very accurately measure the amount of seagrass left in our estuary, my guess is that the loss is far in excess of 50,000 acres. This is a pretty good example. This picture on the left is one of my favorite fishing spots in the Northern Indian River Lagoon. In this area, there used to be a quarter mile wide ribbon of solid seagrass that ran for miles and miles. Following the first major algae blooms in 2011 and 2012, nearly all of that seagrass died. And guess what? It's still gone. It hasn't come back. That area today is mostly sandy bottom and there is some algae growing as well. But the seagrass just isn't coming back. That's a problem because seagrass provides shelter for so many animals that we value. It also provides food for certain animals like manatees and green sea turtles. Now, every once in a while, I get a phone call from a, from a concerned citizen or a boater or an angler saying, hey, Zach, the seagrass is back. The first time I got one of these calls was from a friend of mine who's a full-time fishing guide in the Banana River. And the, the story sounded something like, guess what? The turtle grass is growing in the Banana River. You need to come up and see this. This is great news. I didn't tell him at the time that turtle grass didn't historically grow in the Banana River, but when he described it as turtle grass, I, I had a hunch that he was talking about something other than seagrass. So the next day I, I drove up, we hopped in his boat, we went out and, and this is what we saw. It looks exactly like seagrass, but when you stick your head underwater, what you see is another type of algae or seaweed growing on the bottom called calerpa. Looks like seagrass, but it doesn't function quite like seagrass. The, the, the network of root-like rhizoids don't do a great job of anchoring the bottom. Not too many animals eat calerpa. It doesn't provide great habitat like seagrass does, but it is better than nothing. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the areas in the upper Indian River Lagoon that are being taken over by calerpa 
will eventually see some seagrass growth. It might be that the Calerpa acts to anchor the sediments in a way that facilitates seagrass growth. But there is a less good sign here. Calerpa tends to grow in polluted areas. So this is a pretty good warning sign that the Upper Indian River Lagoon is dealing with some major pollution issues. Now, we talk about seagrass dying during these non-toxic blooms of green and brown algae, but we also experience fish kills during the same blooms. So you say, Zach, how does a non-toxic algae bloom kill fish? Well, it has to do with oxygen. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. This photo was taken during a two-day fish kill that occurred back in 2016. One day I used some computer software to try to estimate how many fish were in this photo. I came up with a number right around 10,000 dead fish in one backyard. Imagine this much carnage across the entire 30 miles of the Banana River. Here's what we think happened. I'll remind you that algae, like plants, conduct photosynthesis. They take in carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen most of the time. But at night, they actually flip and do the opposite. They use respiration instead of photosynthesis, just like we do. So they take in oxygen and they give off carbon dioxide. Additionally, they do this during prolonged periods of cloudy weather. So if you have a, a long cloudy period during a bad algae bloom, we could see oxygen levels drop. Sometimes those oxygen levels get so low that the algae begin to die. And when they die, they rot. And during that decay process, bacteria use up even more oxygen. So it sets up kind of a chain reaction where you go from a really vigorous algae bloom to a die off to a low oxygen condition in very short order. And I'll show you what I mean. These graphs are created by our friends at ORCA, another nonprofit up in Fort Pierce. They maintain a network of water quality sensors throughout the Indian River Lagoon. It's called the Kilroy Network. And you can go right on ORCA's website and download these images. You can look at water sensors throughout the entire Indian River Lagoon. And I've just pulled up a couple of parameters here, but their sensors are actually able to record real time a number of different water quality parameters. On the left side of this image, we're looking at early March of 2016, before the fish kill. The green line represents the amount of algae in the water as measured by chlorophyll concentrations. You can see the up and down pattern. That's daytime, nighttime, daytime, nighttime. The blue line represents the amount of oxygen in the water. And if you look carefully, you'll see that the oxygen peaks correspond to the algae valleys. We have more oxygen um, kind of uh, when, the, when the algae is not really necessarily cranking away. Uh, and and that's, um, that's because what we're seeing is a lag time. All night long, the oxygen levels are being depleted by the algae bloom because it's respiring at night. And there's kind of a lag time where you get a mismatch between the two peaks. As we get into mid-March, you start to see the green line going down. For some reason, the algae bloom started to crash. We don't know exactly why. It may have used up all of the nutrients in the water. It may have been a virus or something that, that caused the algae to get sick. Either way, as the algae bloom collapsed, we saw the oxygen levels go along with it. And as I mentioned, it was probably a combination of a cloudy period and the algae starting to collapse and then bacterial breakdown of the algae bloom the end result was that for two days, oxygen levels in the estuary were nearly at zero. And that's why those fish kills happened. We saw massive amounts of fish and shellfish dying because they were unable to take oxygen out of the water. We didn't see air breathing animals affected by that particular fish kill. You see here that right after the fish kill occurred, oxygen levels normalized. They came back up. Algae levels remained low. This is a really good sign that the algae bloom ended at the fish kill. Here's another graph. Um, the blue is still oxygen levels, and you can see here where the fish kill occurred, oxygen levels were very low. Green in this graph represents water temperature. We were experiencing unseasonably warm water temperatures when that fish kill occurred. Warm water holds less oxygen than cool water, so that exacerbated what happened in the Banana River. What's causing all the algae to grow? Well, it depends, but this video gives you a pretty good indication of what was happening, at least in the Northern Indian River Lagoon. Uh, Zoom doesn't do a great job of streaming videos, so I know this is a little bit choppy, but what you saw in this video 
is somebody spreading fertilizer in a waterfront yard during this massive fish kill. This is a big deal, especially in the Northern Indian River Lagoon. So I wanna take a second to think about nutrients. We use the word nutrients all the time, and I bet some of you are confused as to why we talk about nutrients in a negative light. Normally, nutrients are a positive thing, right? So for humans, we think of things like proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, minerals as nutrients. Nutrients are basically a substance that provides uh, something that's essential for growth and the maintenance of life. In the case of algae bloom, the main nutrients that we're worried about are nitrogen and phosphorus. There are other nutrients that help algae to grow, but the primary ones that we're concerned about are nitrogen and phosphorus. And depending on whether we're looking at a freshwater system or a marine system, that will determine which of those two nutrients is more critical. In marine systems, nitrogen triggers algae blooms. In freshwater systems, it's phosphorus. And that, that's an oversimplification, but it is a pretty good generalization. Where are those nutrients coming from? Well, I'm gonna oversimplify again. They're coming from two things here in Florida. They are coming from fertilizer and they're coming from poo. Fertilizer can mean a lot of different things. Fertilizer can be what we just saw uh, being applied to somebody's bright green yard. It could be something that's spread on golf courses and parks to keep the grass healthy. It can also be agricultural fertilizer on a large scale. Here in Florida, we have one other fertilizer related issue. There are huge phosphate mines in the western part of Florida that produce fertilizer and that exacerbates some of these algae issues as well. Who comes from lots of sources additionally. So when we think about waste, we obviously think about human waste, failing wastewater treatment facilities, leaking pipes, septic tanks, but we also have to think about agricultural waste from uh, the, the dairy cow, beef cow, and poultry industry. I know that's a simplification, but those are the main sources of nutrients entering our waterways. And I want to briefly talk about septic. Sometimes you hear people say things like, well, faulty septic tanks are the problem or malfunctioning septic tanks are the problem. I would argue that here in Florida, any septic tank is a bad septic tank. The way that septic works involves the use of soil microbes to break down waste. We don't have soil in Florida. We have sand, and then immediately under the sand is porous limestone rock. Our water table, in many cases, is just a couple of feet below our feet. So our septic tanks don't have the ability to break down bacteria in a thick soil layer. Water coming out of a septic tank only travels a few feet before it enters the water table and our groundwater moves pretty readily. And we're finding that pollution entering the water table can very easily flow horizontally and end up in our lakes, in our rivers, and in our estuaries. So it's not just about good versus bad septic we really need to think about septic in Florida as being a, a pretty big problem. Now nutrients obviously are, are concerning, but how bad is our nutrient issue? Well, these pictures are shocking evidence of just how many nutrients are in our local waterways. The picture on the left is a mullet that was given to me by a concerned citizen a few years ago. It has filamentous green algae growing on it's gill covers. This was shocking, but I figured it was just a fluke, a one-off circumstance. I, I, I didn't think it was a major problem at the time. And then a few years later, I caught this snook on the right that had the exact same thing happening, a huge clump of green algae literally growing attached to its gill covers. This is a pretty shocking sign that our waters are supercharged with nutrients that are able to fuel algae growth in ways that never occurred historically. Now we looked at some fish kill pictures a minute ago and I emphasized that during that fish kill, we saw water animals dying, but not air breathing animals. We saw fish obviously, but there are also some shellfish involved. We didn't see manatees or dolphins or sea turtles involved in that particular fish kill. But I'm switching gears and I'm gonna start talking about another algae bloom now. Does anybody know based on this photo where I'm going next? What's the next algae story that I'm about to move into? What do you guys think? This is, uh, this is a big deal. Yeah, it's the red tide. So the red tide is yet another algae bloom. 
triggered by microscopic organisms, fueled by excessive nutrients running into our water. But there's a big difference. The red tide is toxic. It's, it's actually quite toxic. This is an incredibly cool electron microscope photo of a single cell of the organism responsible for the Florida red tide called Karenia. It's a dinoflagellate. That means it has two little squiggly flagella that drive it through the water. And you can see in this picture, this is a single flagellum. And that is what allows these cells to move in the water column. This little cell is like a chemical weapons factory. It produces a neurotoxin called brevitoxin. And brevitoxin is not only harmful to fish and shellfish, it can even impact bigger animals like manatees, dolphins, and sea turtles. These animals are affected by breathing in concentrations of the brevitoxin. They're also impacted by eating food that's contaminated by brevitoxin. Brevitoxin builds up through the food chain, so larger animals are experiencing more of it in their tissue. Brevitoxin also affects us. If any of you have ever been to the beach during a severe red tide, you may have experienced some respiratory problems. For me, it causes a really weird dry cough that I just can't stop. That's my body's reaction to inhaling a neurotoxin that's produced by a tiny microbe. Normally the red tide occurs in the Gulf of Mexico, but in 2018, it got so bad that it actually wrapped around our state through the Keys and up the East Coast, setting up shop in our area for about a month during October of 2018. We had pretty severe fish kills along the Treasure and Space Coasts for a fairly substantial amount of time during this red tide. Thankfully, this most recent summer and fall saw a red tide in the Gulf of Mexico, but not on the east coast of Florida. What do you think's fueling the red tide? It's the exact same nutrient inputs that we discussed earlier, nitrogen and phosphorus running into our coastal waters. Now, some of you may have heard that the red tide is entirely natural. It isn't caused by pollution. Humans have nothing to do with it. That's actually not accurate. Yes, the red tide is natural, but lots of harmful things are natural. The red tide's been around for eons. There are documented stories of the red tide occurring during the 1500s. Spanish sailors wrote about it. But the red tide normally and historically occurred out here in the open Gulf of Mexico and occasionally would come into contact with shore. What we're seeing today is a little bit different. Today's red tides last longer, they occur closer to shore, and they're much more widespread. That red tide that occurred in 2018 lasted for more than a year uninterrupted. Essentially, we are throwing gasoline onto a fire by putting all of these human-created nutrients into coastal waters in Florida. Now, as bad as the red tide is, it pales in comparison to this stuff. This is cyanobacteria. It's also called blue-green algae. Those are two words describing the exact same thing. This is a picture that I took in, uh, in the St. Lucie estuary. It is not photoshopped. This particular type of blue-green algae is bright neon green. It smells terrible. It's kind of a rotten sewage smell. It makes your eyes water. It makes you cough. And it's, it's kind, of, kind of a mayonnaise or guacamole consistency floating in the water. The reason this is such a big deal is it is incredibly, incredibly toxic. This stuff causes severe liver damage with very, very short-term exposure. And now there's growing evidence to suggest that it might be linked to things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS in us. So this is a big deal. The particular species of blue-green algae that we're dealing with here in Stewart is called microcystis. And this is a microscopic view of microcystis. What are cyanobacteria? Well, remember earlier I said algae are kind of like plants? Cyanobacteria are kind of like algae. They're not actually algae, they're a primitive form of bacteria, but like algae, they use sunlight to get their energy. They conduct photosynthesis. When I say primitive, these are the kind of organisms that scientists find when they're exploring deep sea hydrothermal vents, 20, 30,000 feet below the ocean surface. These are also the types of organisms that we find growing in hot springs in Yellowstone. 
they may be the kind of things that scientists are looking for when they're exploring other planets. Now, microcystis is not just a Florida story. This stuff occurs all around the globe, anywhere that we have uh, warm, polluted, shallow, fresh water. It's been in the news quite a bit. Um, let me think. I guess most recently there were stories about dogs getting very sick after swimming in ponds and lakes. Those dogs were exposed to cyanobacteria. The city of Toledo, Ohio has also had a big problem with microcystis. Microcystis blooms in Lake Erie. Toledo gets their drinking water out of the lake. During bad bloom years, Toledo has had to shut down their public drinking water supply. Think about that for a second, turning off the drinking water supply for a major city because of a bloom of microbes. Now, this is becoming a bigger issue as our climates change. Warmer, wetter climates favor the growth of these blooms. So I anticipate seeing more and more about cyanobacteria in the news in the future. And I want you guys to just take a look at this photo and these videos to see how thick and viscous these blooms can get. I'm just gonna let this play for a second so you could see how extensive blooms of microcystis can be in our estuary. It's not just the film on the surface. This goes down a little bit. And in fact, these blooms can actually rise and fall based on environmental conditions. Now, sometimes we hear people say that microcystis blooms only happen in stagnant water or dead end canals. That's not the case. On this particular day, we followed this line of algae for miles down the shoreline of the St. Lucie. Here you can see a video that I took in Shepherd Park in downtown Stewart. This is clearly not stagnant water. This is the St. Lucie River flowing along a shoreline, carrying with it toxic cyanobacteria. Now the interesting thing about microcystis, it is a freshwater species. It doesn't live in salt water. So why are we so worried about it here in coastal Florida where we're dealing with primarily brackish water or, or marine ecosystems? Well, our blooms of microcystis are coming from somewhere else. These blooms are being dumped on us from Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee is one of the largest natural freshwater lakes in the United States. If we could go back time, in time, we would see it as the watery heart of the Everglades. So let's go back in time. Uh, Florida Oceanographic Society is currently designing new exhibits for our brand new Ocean Eco Center. And as part of that process, I've been on the hunt for old maps of Florida. And this is the favorite map that I've come across so far. This is a map from 1853, depicting what our state used to look like. This is when Lake Okeechobee truly was the heart of the Everglades. If we could go back to 1853, we would actually see the Everglades starting all the way up here near present day Orlando in a little creek called Shingle Creek. Shingle Creek eventually flowed into the Kissimmee chain of lakes. The Kissimmee chain of lakes flowed into the Kissimmee River. The Kissimmee River was one of those winding oxbow rivers that really wasn't in any hurry to get anywhere in particular. During the wet season, the Kissimmee River would spread out and flood huge uh, floodplain marshes on either side. Those floodplain marshes acted to filter water as it flowed towards Lake Okeechobee. Historically, it would take a drop of water several months to flow from the headwaters of the Everglades into Lake Okeechobee. Now, historically, Lake Okeechobee was quite different than what we know today. The lake had a hard sandy bottom and it expanded and contracted during wet years and dry years. During wet years, the lake would grow and form these huge marshes around the perimeter. During dry years, it would shrink down considerably. During the wet season, 
water used to fill the lake to the point that the lake itself would actually overflow gently to the south. That overflow would percolate through a vast pond apple and cypress forest, and eventually it would spread out to form the river of grass, the Everglades itself. The Everglades was historically a flowing river. It was only a foot or two deep in most places, but 40 miles wide and 100 miles long, it used to flow from the bottom of Lake Okeechobee all the way down to the southern tip of Florida. There was nowhere else on earth like it. Unfortunately, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, our government, they didn't see any value for the Everglades. They, they didn't know any better. They wanted to drain the entire ecosystem to turn it into farmland. They started by cutting enormous drainage canals to drain water out of Lake Okeechobee and off of the Everglades. And then following two big hurricanes in the 1920s, they started construction on an enormous dam that would eventually go all the way around the lake. That dam, the Herbert Hoover Dyke, eventually cut off water flow to the Everglades, allowing us to drain about half of the historical Everglades ecosystem. Today, most of that drained land is farmland. Most of that farmland is currently in sugarcane cultivation. This area of the Everglades became the Everglades agricultural area. Additionally, urban areas that we know of today in Western Palm Beach, Broward and Dade counties were built on top of the drained Everglades. When you build an enormous dam around an enormous lake, what do you do with all that lake water when it rains? Well, that's one of the biggest problems we're dealing with right now. Water managers decided to build two enormous man-made canals to artificially connect Lake Okeechobee to the coast. So let's go back to our historical map. One of those canals was dredged right through here, connecting Lake Okeechobee to the Caloosahatchee River, which flows into Charlotte Harbor and eventually the Gulf of Mexico over near Fort Myers. The other canal was dredged right here, connecting Lake Okeechobee to our St. Lucie River here in Stewart. Neither of those canals historically existed. Neither of those estuaries were naturally connected to Lake Okeechobee. This is an entirely man-made construct. So here's a view of our side of this story. This is the C-44 canal that dumps into the South Fork of the St. Lucie River. Now, folks, I want you to listen to some numbers. In 2016, those two canals dumped 700 billion gallons of Lake Okeechobee's water out to sea. The next year, 2017, in just three months following Hurricane Irma, our canal here in Stewart got about 190 billion gallons of water. Fast forward to 2018, third year in a row, our discharges began in June. They didn't stop until October. During that period of time, we had about three quarters of a billion gallons per day dumping into our estuary. And then what about 2019, this most recent year? Well, we had discharges, but instead of being during the summertime when we worry about algae blooms, we also worry about animals reproducing during the summer, our Discharges happened in March of 2019, and that's a big deal. Discharges in the spring are typically less harmful than discharges during the heat of the summer. Why did we have discharges in the, in the spring of 2019? Well, it's all because of you guys. You, as concerned citizens, as business owners, as boaters and anglers, your voices finally got heard by our elected officials. Several elected officials pressured management agencies, particularly the um, US Army Corps of Engineers, to reduce water levels in Lake Okeechobee before the wet season, so the lake would have more capacity to absorb water once the rains hit. One of the quickest fixes to Florida's water issues involves management changes, not huge construction projects. 
It worked. By lowering the lake in the spring of 2019, we did not have damaging discharges in algae blooms during the summer. So this year, we're having a dry season. So we don't really have to worry about discharges right now. But even if we had a rainy winter and spring, we would not have seen the Army Corps lowering Lake Okeechobee again. And here's why. U.S. Sugar, one of the major sugar farming companies that operates in the Everglades agricultural area, sued the federal government to prevent that from happening again. Lake Okeechobee is an important water supply for the Everglades agricultural area, and that farming organization did not want to see that water supply threatened by environmentally protective discharges in the spring. So those discharges are what bring algae blooms from Lake Okeechobee into our communities. When cyanobacteria bloom in Lake Okeechobee, the blooms can be pretty severe. They can actually be seen from outer space sometimes. This is an enhanced set of images from 2018 and at its worst, the cyanobacteria blooms in Lake Okeechobee covered 90% of the lake. Why are these blooms happening? Well, there are too many nutrients in Lake Okeechobee. Let's think for a second. Does anybody know where those nutrients are coming from? What do you think, guys? Yeah, I'm seeing some good guesses. Uh, right now, most of those nutrients are coming from points further north, primarily inflow from the Kissimmee River. So agriculture north of the lake and urban development north of the lake. There's a lot of poultry and, and dairy cow and beef cow farming, citrus, and obviously human population growth. What about that farmland south of the lake? Well, honestly, today, they're not the biggest polluters anymore. They've had to clean up their act. They don't send dirty water back into the lake anymore. However, for the last 100 years or so, they did. So there are what we call legacy nutrients trapped in the mud in the bottom of Lake Okeechobee. All of those years of pumping agricultural water back into the lake created a, a black ooze on the bottom of the lake that gets stirred up today during windy weather or the passage of a hurricane. So it's entirely possible that fertilizer that was applied to a sugarcane field 50 years ago can still get stirred up and cause algae blooms today. Again, though, I want to emphasize most of our pollution in the lake is coming from the north. Today, the farming south of the lake is more of an obstacle to restoration rather than a source of new pollution. So take a look at these images for a second. They tell us a lot about why we get algae in the St. Lucie estuary. This image shows the mouth of the C-44 canal and the shoreline of Lake Okeechobee. We can clearly see blue-green algae getting sucked into the C-44 canal. If you fly a little bit further down canal or down river, you could see that algae getting washed through the S-80 flood control structure and into the St. Lucie River. Folks, connect the dots. When we have blue-green algae in the St. Lucie River, it's coming from Lake Okeechobee. It's not caused by coastal pollution. Now, that said, Coastal pollution is still a problem. We really need to try to eliminate the use of fertilizer in our area. We need to fix our antiquated stormwater treatment facilities. And we need to get rid of septic. But those are not the problems that are leading to blue-green algae blooms in coastal Florida. And this story, it's not just about cyanobacteria. Salinity is an issue as well. Salinity can actually be a really big issue in some cases. This is an aerial image showing the mouth of the St. Lucie River, St. Lucie Inlet, during a clear day. This 
is the northern end of the Florida Coral Reef Track. This is the same coral reef that connects all the way down to the Florida Keys. This here, north of the inlet, is a different type of reef. This is a worm reef built by little tiny worms instead of coral. Both our worm reef and our coral reef, they're really important for lots and lots of animals that we value. Unfortunately, our freshwater discharges are harming them. This is an aerial image of the same area during a bad discharge. That plume of dirty fresh water can travel as far as 10 or 15 miles out to sea. Now, for a second, let's pretend that that water isn't dirty. It's clean, it's clear, clean enough to drink. It's just fresh. Well, that fresh water in and of itself can be considered a form of pollution when it's being dumped at the wrong time or into the wrong places. That fresh water can kill plants and animals that need salty water to live, things like oysters and seagrasses. That can also have a negative impact on hundreds of other animals that live in and around our oyster reefs and seagrass beds. So take a look here. This is an aerial image of the seagrass beds that used to exist just inside of St. Lucie Inlet. I still remember my first time fishing this area. I was blown away by how much seagrass we had. It was just a continuous dense carpet of grass. Following our major discharges in 2016, pretty much all of that grass died. Today, most of that area is just sandy bottom. When we have a good period of, of clean water like we have right now, the seagrasses are trying to come back, but they're sparse. They're not you know, as thick or as dense as they once were. It's certainly nothing like what that area should look like but it is a good sign that nature is resilient. And if we can continue to keep our waterways somewhat clean for an extended period of time, we will see improvements. So what are we doing to fix all of these problems? Well, first and foremost, I wanna emphasize that most of Florida's water issues are political, not scientific. We understand the science behind these problems. We need political support to make restoration feasible. So what, what is science telling us? What is the fix to all of this? There isn't one single silver bullet fix. The problem's far too complicated. However, there is one thing we could do right now that would have a bigger impact than anything else. We need to purchase some of that farmland in the Everglades agricultural area, you know, that used to be the Everglades, and we need to turn that land back into wetlands. We need to make man-made filter marshes. These filter marshes use aquatic plants to gobble up nitrogen and phosphorus, cleaning Lake Okeechobee's water so it's actually clean enough to flow back into the Everglades where it's desperately needed. And that's one of the worst ironies of this whole story. While we've been getting way too much fresh water here on the coast, parts of the Everglades have been dealing with horrible, horrible droughts. As recently as 2015 and 2016, Florida Bay, down here in Everglades National Park, got so salty from a drought that more than 50,000 acres of their seagrass died. And we're actually concerned about that happening again right now. We're having an exceptionally dry winter and spring this year, and salinities in Florida Bay are on the rise. One of my fishing guide friends uh, mentioned recently that for the last several weeks, salinities in Florida Bay were actually higher than the ocean. There's no fresh water getting to the Everglades right now. Does that mean there's no fresh water available to the Everglades? Not exactly. Do you guys see all of these red arrows? These indicate water sources coming from Lake Okeechobee and into the Everglades agricultural area to irrigate cropland. This morning, I pulled up the latest numbers for water flowing out of Lake Okeechobee. So even though we're in a drought, and even though the Everglades in Florida Bay aren't getting any water, look at these three circled numbers. As of today, these three canals going into the Everglades agricultural area are dumping 330 million gallons per day into farmland. That sounds like a big number, but actually I checked this a couple of days ago, it was 1.2 billion gallons a day at that time. 
I think they're turning the faucet back a little bit in anticipation of the rain that we're going to get this weekend. So yes, there is water available to keep the Everglades healthy, but right now management decisions are being made to provide free irrigation water to private industry rather than using some of that water to keep the Everglades healthy, to support our economies, and to make sure our aquifers get recharged so our drinking water doesn't become salty. Think about that for a second. 330 million gallons a day going into farmland. Look at all these zeros down here. None of that is making it into the Everglades. Now, we mentioned that the Everglades isn't getting enough fresh water and our estuaries are getting too much. So why don't we just build a big canal or put in a big pipe to reconnect Lake Okeechobee back to the Everglades? Well, it's not so simple. Lake Okeechobee's too polluted. If, if Lake Okeechobee was a factory instead of a lake, it would be getting fined right now under the Clean Water Act because of how dirty it is. And that, that's one way of thinking about it. There are some plants that like to be fertilized, but there are actually some plants that don't like to be fertilized. The plants that make up most of the Everglades have evolved in the absence of nutrients. They don't do well when they're fertilized. So when you dump fertilizer rich water into the Everglades, it can have catastrophic consequences. So there's no way for us to send that water south without cleaning it first. And that's where those big filter marshes come in. And we do have some good news to report. Our outgoing governor about a year and a half ago signed a law into place that will allow Florida to work with the federal government to build a big filter marsh in the Everglades agricultural area. Originally, the proposal called for a shallow, vegetated, 60,000 acre wetland. It would have worked beautifully, but we're not gonna get it. The state of Florida had money set aside to buy farmland at fair market price to build that wetland. The farmers south of Lake Okeechobee were not willing sellers. In fact, the agricultural lobby got a hold of our former governor and convinced him to take that opportunity completely off the table. So today, what we're looking at is a much smaller filter marsh built on about 16,000 acres of land that's already owned by the state. It's better than nothing, but it's not what we were hoping for. The other problem is that 16,000 acres of state-owned land was already filtering water in a different way. We are optimistic that this Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir will reduce discharges to the coast and provide fresh water to the Everglades, especially during times of drought like we're experiencing right now. We just wish it was a little bit bigger. There is really good news to report. They just broke ground on the filter marsh that will be affiliated with that wetland a little over a week ago. And we know that these filtration marshes work because we already have six of them out in the Everglades agricultural area. Taxpayers, you and I, have paid to build and maintain those marshes and they work really well. But right now they're only being used to clean agricultural runoff from the Everglades agricultural area. They're not being used to clean Lake Okeechobee's water. So hopefully in the future, we'll have a big filter marsh and reservoir that will serve the same purpose. Those six filter marshes that we have in existence right now are a big part of why the sugar industry is not the biggest polluter anymore. What they are is the biggest obstacle to restoration. So those filter marshes that we talked about are actually part of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, SERP. This is the largest environmental restoration project on earth. It involves 68 different components, and it was signed into law in the year 2000. So in the last 20 years, how many of those projects do you think have been completed? I mean, 20 years is a long time, right? Certainly some of these restoration projects have been finished. What do you guys think? So I'm seeing some different numbers pop up. The answer is one has been fully completed, but the project that was completed was the construction of a building. Uh, as part of SERP, they built a research facility to study invasive plants like Malaleuca and Brazilian pepper. That's the only SERP project that's been 100% seen through to completion. But 
there is a good deal of movement with other projects. And in the near future, we hope to see more of those projects wrapping up. This again is about politics and having funding available to take these projects through to completion. And this is where you guys come in. You are ultimately the best hope for Florida's waters. I want you to live smart, vote smart, constantly share your knowledge with others and never stop learning. I know it seems impossible sometimes, but your individual voices can have a huge impact. And I'll give you an example. In 2016, we had a big election. We also had a really bad environmental year. Not one candidate went on TV to talk about how they were gonna help the environment. If you fast forward just two years to 2018, we had another big election. We had another really bad environmental year. However, things changed. Every single candidate from county commission right up to Congress went on TV to tell us how they were gonna help Florida's waters. Some of them didn't even have an environmental background, but they realized that if they didn't talk about the environment, they were not gonna get elected into office. Now, I have to be honest with you, Getting elected is one thing, following through with those promises is much more important. Not all of our elected officials have truly made the environment their priority once gaining office, but this is still a move in the right direction. I don't care whether they're motivated by, by personal desires or motivated by the need to serve their constituents. As long as our elected officials are starting to look at the environment and the needs of, of their constituents over the needs of big donors and special interest groups, we're moving in the right direction. I'm optimistic that each year moving forward, um, we'll see more about the environment during election cycles, and we'll see more candidates who actually have a personal connection to the environment. The only reason we saw a change from 2016 through 2018 was because all of you got vocal, stayed vocal, and kept your foot on the gas. Nobody quieted down even when we had a, a short period of improved environmental conditions. People kept writing letters, they kept emailing, they kept making phone calls, and they kept getting on microphone and speaking at public meetings. Folks, it really does add up, and our individual voices are the only reason we're starting to see this paradigm shift, the only reason why there was a management decision made last year to lower Lake Okeechobee in March, the only reason that we've already seen groundbreaking on the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir. There is hope, and with that, I wanna thank all of you for taking time to learn about this really important issue. I will tell you again, this was just the tip of the iceberg. There's no way to cover all of this in, in detail in one hour, but I hope I was able to give you a, a good overview of the problem. And, and I also hope I was able to generate some more questions in your mind. Um, for anybody who's watching on Facebook Live, I apologize, we're gonna to have to get to your questions at a later time. We're, we're doing this live on Zoom right now. But what I will do in a second is open up the Q&A tab. If any of you have questions, go ahead and type them into the Q&A tab. I do have a few minutes to try to answer those now. And also, I do want to mention one other thing. Um, if you enjoyed today's free presentation, I'd love you to think about visiting our website and clicking our Donate tab. It's right in the upper right-hand corner at floridaocean.org. We, again, are a nonprofit. Most of our income is generated by admissions to our coastal center. Because of COVID-19, our coastal center has been closed for two months. That doesn't mean we're stopped. We are still busy doing our research and restoration work. We just lost our main income stream. So even a tiny donation would mean a lot to us right now in, uh, you know, in light of, uh, of the situation that we're all dealing with. All right, folks, let me open up my Q&A tab and see what we've got here. All right, is the St. Lucie estuary technically still part of the Indian River Lagoon Estuary. I would say it's not necessarily part of the Indian River Lagoon Estuary, but it's a major tributary of the Indian River Lagoon. So what happens in the St. Lucie has the ability to impact parts of the Indian River Lagoon. Like we talked about earlier, the seagrass die-offs in Stewart are largely triggered by Lake Okeechobee discharges. Those algae issues that we saw in the Northern Indian River Lagoon, the brown tide, the fish kills, that has nothing to do with Lake Okeechobee. 
Those issues are primarily local, driven by failing um, sewage treatment plants, the abundance of septic systems, and also to a lesser degree, backyard fertilizer and people throwing grass clippings and pet waste into the water. So yes, the St. Lucie's part of the IRL system. Technically, it's not truly the Indian River Lagoon. All right, somebody asked a question about the red tides that were documented offshore in the 1500s. There are natural nutrient sources in the ocean. Deeper ocean areas tend to have more nutrients than surface areas. That's because over time, things decay and sink down to the bottom. In areas where ocean currents push that bottom water up to the surface, we have a phenomenon known as an upwelling. Upwellings in the Gulf of Mexico used to bring that nutrient-rich deep water up to the surface. And we think that's probably part of why originally red tides occurred further out in the Gulf. So hopefully that answers your question about the original historical um, nutrient pulse that was responsible for red tides before we started polluting coastal waters in Florida. All right, how realistic would it be to dredge Lake Okeechobee's muck to remove all of those legacy nutrients that I mentioned trapped down in the mud, you know, the, the fertilizer that was applied 50, 60, 70 years ago that's still lingering as, a, as an afterthought. I have to tell you, this is just my personal opinion. I don't know that we're going to fix Florida's water problems through brilliant engineering like dredging out muck from Lake Okeechobee or dredging muck from the Indian River Lagoon or applying some sort of chemical treatment to the water. That's another thing we hear about quite often. There's no way to scale those types of projects up. They might work in a backyard canal or a small pond. And in fact, they do. There are examples of ponds that have been cleaned up by spreading certain chemicals that bind to nutrients. There are examples of, of ponds and canals being cleaned up through dredging. We're just looking at too big of a scale. I think, in my opinion, we need to focus more on cutting off the nutrient sources that are affecting our waterways. And over time, the existing nutrients will start to dissipate. So right now for Lake Okeechobee, we need to slow the flow of nutrients from the north. That means changing agriculture. We're not anti-agriculture. We need to grow food to eat. But I would argue two things. I would argue that sugar is not food. And I would argue that we can grow crops in a more sustainable fashion. So by, by growing crops more sustainably north of the lake, we can reduce nutrient inputs, and we also have to ask society as a whole to change our practices. There's a lot of people living north of Lake Okeechobee, and they are a part of the nutrient inputs that are affecting the lake. There are ways that we can modernize wastewater treatment. There are ways we can improve um, groundwater storage and retention through um, putting grass down instead of pavement or providing drainage swales to catch runoff rather than allowing that water to run right into the, into the canal systems. One of the things that's already being done is that that Kissimmee River, which was, I didn't mention it, but it was dredged in the 1960s. They're working to restore the Kissimmee River to help clean up that water. Remember, the Kissimmee River used to filter water before it got to Lake Okeechobee. One of the restoration projects that's being undertaken currently will, will try to restore some of that filtration capacity. So yes, there are ways to reduce nutrients coming into the lake. From an engineering perspective, I don't believe it's feasible to dredge all the muck out of the lake to solve that problem. If septic systems are so terrible, why are they commonly used in Florida? Is it because they're cheaper than sewer systems? I think the simple answer is yes, and many of those septic systems were put in at a time where we just didn't have the infrastructure in place. Uh, in many areas, there is a push to shift from septic to sewer. The problem is a lot of our municipal sewage plants are falling apart. They are leaking, they're having spills, and they don't have the capacity to handle all of the homes that would eventually be connected if we switched from septic to sewer. So it's sort of a two-phased approach. We need to get people off of septic, but we also need to make sure our municipal wastewater treatment plants are modernized so that they're not another nutrient source. It is disturbing though that they are still permitting brand new um, septic tank construction in many parts of Florida. And one of the most shocking things I learned in certain counties, you only need two feet between the bottom of your drain field, your leach field, and the top of the water table. Two feet, that's not enough ground to uh, allow bacteria to break down wastes coming out of a septic tank. How do I think muck removal should be ranked as a remedy to the Indian River Lagoon? So just like Lake Okeechobee, 
the Indian River Lagoon is dealing with muck, that black organic mayonnaise slime on the bottom of the water. And in the Indian River Lagoon, like in Lake Okeechobee, the muck is rich in nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. There are efforts to dredge that muck out to get those nutrients out of the water. Here's the problem. If we aren't stopping the source of those nutrients coming into the water, the muck will just refill the same areas that it's being dredged out of. I do believe muck removal is an important component of restoring the Indian River Lagoon. Personally, I think it should be happening later on. We need to address sewage and septic issues first, and then we need to come back through and get rid of all the old muck. The other problem, the, the bad part of muck is the liquid part. If you were to squeeze muck, like squeezing a sponge, the liquid that comes out of it is the stuff that's rich in nutrients. As of right now, engineers have not done a great job of removing the nitrogen and phosphorus from that, that pore water before putting the water right back into the estuary. They are getting better. Newer muck removal projects require some treatment of the liquid coming out of the muck, but it's far from perfect. So I think muck removal is important, but to me it's much less important than updating sewage infrastructure and getting people off of septic. Uh, so somebody asked, can you speak to the difference between blue-green algae and cyanobacteria? They are identical. They are literally two identical words for the same thing. Cyanobacteria is the word that scientists use. Blue-green algae, that's just a term that is commonly used to refer to cyanobacteria. They are one in the same. This is just an English language thing, not a biology thing. Cyanobacteria and blue-green algae can be used interchangeably. You may have noticed um, during some algae blooms, the news media initially used the word algae quite often, and then they started using cyanobacteria. A big part of that was environmental organizations coaching our news media to try to get it right. There is a difference between algae and blue-green algae. We talked about that earlier. Uh, remember, algae are plant-like organisms that aren't quite plants. Cyanobacteria are algae-like bacteria that aren't quite algae. So they are biologically different. Cyanobacteria slash blue-green algae are very primitive. Algae are a little bit more advanced. But the difference between cyanobacteria and blue-green algae, again, surely vocabulary, not scientific. Somebody asked about resources on this particular topic. Um, this video will be available through Florida Oceanographic Society's educational resource page. So if you have students that are interested in learning about the environment, you can actually watch this with them at a later date. We have other resource videos available right now, including the lecture that I did last week on the science behind oyster restoration. Just go to floridaocean.org. Right from our home screen, there's a link to our educational resources page where you can download not just videos, but educational lesson plans and packets that are broken down by grade level. The other thing I wanna mention is one week from today, I'm doing another one of these live webinars on a much happier topic. A week from today, next Friday, we're gonna be doing a webinar about sea turtles. So tune in if you're interested in learning about the biology and ecology and conservation of sea turtles. Again, 12 noon, and uh, you can find registration information on Florida Oceanographic's website under events. Will returning water flow from Lake Okeechobee to the Everglades cause people to lose their homes? Absolutely, emphatically, no. This is a propaganda piece generated by the agricultural industry, basically saying the, the environmentalists wanna take people out of their homes and displace people. They're gonna flood your homes. Absolutely not. The only areas that are slated for marshland construction are currently farm fields. So in order to get water flowing back into the Everglades, engineers purchase farmland, they build a network of levees around the farm fields, and then they build dividers within the levees. And those dividers create a network of cells, like a checkerboard. In each of those cells, they create different types of wetlands that have different water depths and use different types of aquatic plants to gobble up nitrogen and phosphorus. Those fields become almost like an aquarium filter, like in my fish tank behind me here. And they do a really good job of using up the nitrogen and phosphorus that comes into the, the wetland from the north. None of those wetlands will be built 
anywhere near the cities and towns that exist around the Everglades. Again, the, you know, let me think of a nice way of saying this. The agricultural industry in Florida has used propaganda to misdirect people in our state, sort of like the tobacco industry back in the 1980s said that cigarettes were harmless. There are scientists working on this problem who don't agree with me. There are scientists who see the story from an agricultural perspective. And on TV or in the newspaper, you may say stories or articles that have facts that are a little different than what I talked about today. And in general, most of the stories that you hear that are promoted by special interest groups tend to be accurate, but they omit certain facts. They can't lie. You know, if, if somebody gets on TV and says a fact, that's very easy to fact check that. But in general, some of the stories that we hear about the harmful side effects related to fixing Florida's water problems are missing very key concepts. So this idea of taking away homes to fix the Everglades is a piece of propaganda. So another question about using engineering to fix these problems, somebody asked, can these algae blooms be physically collected and extracted and filtered to remove them from the water? There's just no way to do that on the scale that we're talking about. If you had a backyard pond, maybe you could run a skimmer to skim some algae out of the water. We're talking about an enormous lake and huge amounts of water, billions of gallons of water being discharged. It's not feasible. Although that question does bring up a pretty important point. Uh, some of you may have heard about the issues that are occurring in Florida right now related to the application of herbicides like Roundup to our waterways. This is a big deal. Spraying aquatic plants kills your filter. It also creates rotting vegetation that releases nutrients back into the water. And the chemical Roundup, it's called glyphosate, it actually has some phosphorus in it. So it in and of itself is nutrient pollution. Right this minute, the state of Florida is asking people to come up with solutions removing aquatic vegetation without using chemicals. So in my opinion, there are mechanical options for removing nuisance aquatic vegetation from freshwater bodies without spraying chemicals. And the side effect of that, when you pull those plants out of the water, you're actually taking the nutrients out of the water. So can we use engineering to fix the algae issue? Probably not. But with the budget that we currently have for herbicide spraying, I mean, it's a huge amount of money they use to spray toxins into our waterways. I think we can switch over to more of a mechanical approach. It's just gonna take time and support again from our political leaders. Let me see here. I, I see just a couple more questions. I'm gonna wrap up. Um, this is a great question. Can filter feeders be used to reduce algae concentrations in at-risk areas? Well, yes and no. Uh, our good friends at the Smithsonian Research Institute in Fort Pierce are actually testing different filter feeders to see how well they remove algae from the Indian River Lagoon. There's two problems. It turns out that some of our not so good types of algae, uh, particularly that Ario umbra, the brown tide, it's not the favorite food of many of our filter feeders. The other problem is we've seen huge declines in our filter feeder populations throughout the Indian River Lagoon. I'm reading a book right now written in the 1880s about a, a gentleman's travel through the Indian River and everywhere he stops there are just acres of healthy oyster reefs. We've lost nearly 80% of the oysters in the St. Lucie estuary, probably similar numbers if not greater throughout the Indian River Lagoon. So we don't really have the, the number of filter feeders present that we once did. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Florida Oceanographic Society's behind the scenes research work, restoring filter feeders like oysters is a huge part of the science that we are busily engaged in. We, uh, we have an active habitat re restoration program where we replant mangrove trees, and seagrasses, marsh plants, and oysters with the hopes of trying to clean up the water in our local estuaries. And with that, folks, I, I've gone through all of our Q&As, so I'm going to wrap up. If you have any additional questions, feel free to email me. We're going to send you a follow-up email that will have a link to my uh, direct email address. I would love to discuss this topic further. And, and I'll be honest, if you want to have a phone call, I'm, I'm always available to chat about these issues. It's really important that you understand these problems. It's really important that you're able to understand um, science versus myth. 
And it's really important that you're able to separate good science from not so good science when you talk about these issues. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, there's a lot of misleading information floating around. I, I always try to give you the most up-to-date, the most accurate, and the most unbiased information. The truth is we're dealing with a population issue, whether we're looking at agriculture, whether we're looking at septic and sewer, whether we're looking at just people in general, there are a lot more people in Florida than there were 100 years ago. And that is the ultimate core of the problem. But there are ways to fix those issues. And again, the single biggest thing you can do is stay politically engaged. Make your vote count. I know there are lots of important political issues floating around right now. But if you love the water, try to pick a candidate that has at least some interest in trying to fix our water issues, along with any other important political topics that mean a lot to you. All right, folks, thank you so much again for hanging out with us today. I had a great time sharing, uh, sharing this important topic with you. And again, I, I, uh, I hope to see you again at some point in the future. One week from today, 12 o'clock on Friday, the 15th, I believe, we'll be talking about sea turtles. Take care, everyone. Have a great day.